Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December 2021 Legacies and Lunch, a program of the Central Arkansas Library Center's Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, the Outreach Coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library houses the galleries and bookstore at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and of course, the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The Roberts Library Research Room is open Tuesday through Friday from 10 to 5, and we will be open on Saturday, no, uh, sorry, December 4th, and Saturday, December 18th from noon until 4 for bonus Saturdays. So please go to robertslibrary.org for all the specifics before planning your visit. This program is being live streamed to YouTube and will, and will be available to view on Cal's YouTube channel immediately following the end of the program. The speakers will answer questions at the end of the session, so please type your questions in the chat box on Zoom. And now for today's program. I am so glad to welcome this month's speakers. We have Walter Imahara and David Meltzer to talk about their forthcoming book, Jerome and Rower, Memories of Japanese American Internment in World War II Arkansas. The book should be out in January, 2022, but you can pre-order copies at the U of A Press. So I'll put that link in the chat here when I turn it over to them. So Walter was born in California where his family were prominent members of the local Japanese American farming community before World War II. After being interned at Jerome and then Rower, he became a US Army officer, the owner of a successful nursery and landscape business and a national champion weightlifter. He is the author of I Am an American, Japanese American, Asian Cajun. And David is an associate professor at the College of Integrative Science and Arts at the University, oh sorry, at Arizona State University in Mesa, Arizona. So everybody, please give a warm virtual welcome to Walter and David. And now I'm going to ask y'all to unmute and I'm going to. So I presume you can all hear me. Yeah, okay. Uh, the book we're talking about today took a long time to put together. We have many dozens of contributors and Walter spent many years collecting the, their, right, their written reminiscences, their memories of World War II. The, um, let's see, I don't seem to have control. Ah, here we go. Hmm. This is the cover of the book. And the photograph shows uh, American citizens in prison in Arkansas during World War II, not for any crimes that they committed because they didn't commit any crimes, but simply because their parents or grandparents came from Japan. Uh, the book uh, will be published next month by University of Arkansas Press and it's available, available for pre-order. The origins, the events that precipitated the need for this book were uh, 80 years ago this week. They happened 80 years ago this week with the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. A few months after that attack, the president issued an order that forced more than 110,000 Americans uh, of Japanese descent away from their homes on the West Coast, the West Coast states, that included nearly 70,000 United States citizens. They had not been accused of any crime. They had not committed any crime, but they were imprisoned behind barbed wire. They were guarded by armed soldiers. Many of these internees lost their homes, their farms, their businesses, their personal property, and in some cases never to be recovered. Many of them were located many thousands, thousands of miles away from their homes on the West Coast, uh, some as far as Arkansas. And in Arkansas, they were put in the relocation centers called Jerome and Rower. And this book tells the personal stories of former internees of the Jerome and Rower internment camps. Uh, and some of the stories were written by their close family members. 
Jane, the uh, tell you a little bit about Walter's family. The, his father, James Amahara, was a very successful farm owner and businessman in Florin, California, before the war. He was a leader in the Japanese American farming community. But in 1942, the entire family, along with many thousands of other families, were forced to leave their home. They had to abandon their successful farm business. They had to leave all their personal property except what they can put in a single suitcase or a duffel bag and carry it with them. They were first moved to what was called the Fresno Assembly Center, and they were forced to live in horse stalls, literally stalls that housed horses form, that were adapted to uh, house these prisoners. And then a few months later, they were all forcibly relocated to Denson, Arkansas, to the Jerome Relocation Center. At that time, Walter, who was James's oldest son, was five years old. And at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Walter, and he will tell you his story. OK, here you see the uh, Fresno Assembly Center, which we went to just a few years ago but it took me close to 77 years to return. Okay, and when we went to the Fresno Assembly Center, uh, it, we went to the fairgrounds. Of course, the fairgrounds and buildings were not there. Okay, next slide. Next one is uh, when we got to uh, Fresno, we got there on, uh, in uh, May 29th, okay. And on June 2nd, my mother had a child, the first child to be born in camp, but the facilities were not there at the camp for uh, birth. So she was, she was taken to the Fresno uh, hospital. Okay, and then uh, something strange happened. Uh, uh, the uh, hospital would not issue a birth certificate. And my father went back and he asked about it. And they said, they don't know what to put in as citizens. He said, well, so he put in citizen US. He said, well, we're at the war with Japan. And my father said, you, we have nothing to do with that. And you had to put US citizen and they did. So that was the beginning of the trauma. And they have a, on the site uh, and uh, this, I've seen this, I've never seen a photo of it, but there's a, a whole uh, plaque of all, the plaque of all the internees during the period. And I looked on there and right, right at the top is my uh, Imahara, is my sister Flora, then my mother, Haruka, uh, Irene, uh, James is uh, my father, and my sister Jane is next. And my brother John, uh, my brother June, who was born there. Okay, and my way down there at the bottom, you see my sister Lily and May. And on next, I'm way at the top. And it's kind of hard to uh, look at a plaque that's been placed there with your name on it. Okay, and there's other people on there, of course, are deceased. It's in the alphabetical order. It was a, quite a sight to see. Okay, we lived there for five months and uh, then we took that long trip to uh, Arkansas and most of us never been on a train. And you could see we were there, what, four days, five nights and we finally go across the country in a, in a broken down train. The seats were bad, the bathroom facility was almost non-existent and we finally get to Arkansas, okay? And what do you see? This uh, rows and rows of uh, tall paper buildings and many of them were not finished. And I, my parents said when they got there, there was, uh, you had to live in whatever was uh, already given to you, see? Okay, and that, uh, that photo that you've seen of the, uh, my, uh, the, the tower was drawn by my, Sister Lily, so that puts her about age seven. She wrote, uh, and this is the tower 
as it is at that time in Arkansas. And there's a photo that was taken uh, at Jerome, okay? And this, uh, there's a lot of folks in here, but with the arrow, well, that's me. Well, you know, I'm uh, uh, five years old. And so, and all the way to my right is my uh, father, where you see the arrow, that's my father, okay? And below is my sister Irene, and going to the left is, next is to the left is my brother John. Okay, then you see me, and then you see my sister Lily, and then way right in the middle of it is my sister, my, my mother, and my, uh, my brother June, who spelled J-U-N. Uh, he has no uh, English American name, but my father was real bitter, so his name is just June, J-U-N. And that, that uh, photo up there, my sister made the oldest in the family, and she was about 15. Okay, and then my next is my sister Flora. And <clears throat> okay, then we were forced to move again about 25 miles away because this camp we were in uh, was given to the German prison war. Okay, and here, I can't believe what David found these photos because no photos were ever taken there. But here it is, and this was transported from Jerome to Roar about 25 miles away. And, and I don't know where these photos, look at this photo, this was in color. And they have movie, they moving, wow. And this is the way they were transported. Well, I would say uh, about 9,500. And of course, the land was swampy and you could see the boards. And look how these ladies have to pass each other on boards. And what a beautiful uh, photo that I've never seen before as we entered the Roar relocation. This photo was taken uh, while we're there, and I'm uh, always on the I'm on the left side, Walter of the tallest, okay, and my uh, brother John is uh, with the arrow showing, and below is my brother June, who was born in Fresno, and my sister Irene. And we're all very young. And here's my mother, 35 years old, and she, uh, this is a, she uh, had all those children, and she really took over the uh, leadership of the family at that time. Because my father left to go to uh, Chicago to work, and my mother stayed behind, and and she was, uh, for that age, when you lose everything, it's kind of tough. But you know, as children, it wasn't so bad because we always had our parents, we had food. This is my first grade, okay? And around 1944, and, and that's me sitting there and I'm leaning next to a young lady named Joanne Okada. And to this day, we're still friends. And that's been over 80 years. I graduated from uh, Southwestern uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana in 1960. And when I graduated, uh, I was told I was the first agent uh, to graduate from there. And the president, when he at the, uh, handed me the, my diploma says, I'm the first Asian Cajun to ever graduated. And, not, and now it's been over 60 years. I'm still called 
the aging Cajun. And as soon as I graduated, I had to go uh, in the service and uh, I was, there's four of us in this uh, boys, I'm the oldest, okay? And all four of us joined, okay? And all four returned, okay? And when I was uh, uh, made a lieutenant, where did it send me? They sent me to Germany. And in Germany, uh, I was stationed at Camp Dachau. Okay, this is uh, the site of the drone camp uh, recently taken. And above my head, you see a chimney. And at Jerome, that's the only thing is remaining is a chimney. Everything else is nothing but farms. And in just one location, they have that little monument. And this is Roar uh, Relocation Center. And there they have some nice display of uh, the cemetery and some uh, monuments. This is, uh, in 1990, we received a letter of apology and a check for 20,000. And this only went to people that were living at that time. Okay, and you can remember when we got the apology, if you go back, it took 45 years. And most of us, we won the apology and the money was insignificant. When we uh, were in the nursery business, always wanted to build a garden. So at Hemingbow in St. Francisville, Louisiana, about uh, uh, 45 minutes north of Baton Rouge, uh, we found a piece of property at the uh, Hemingbow is a recreational facility. And behind here is a, a 45 acre lake. And on this property, of course, you see a red Tory gate. And you see my father's kettle. Okay? And you can see like the plant material has all been trimmed. Here I am standing uh, in the gardens. Uh, we, we had to bring the rocks in, boulders, because there's no boulders in uh, Louisiana. In the uh, background, you see the back of the first uh, uh, Tory gate it has Imahara carved in it, was carved by my father many years ago. This Tory gate, is uh, very unusual because it has a rope. Uh, and this rope I got from the ferry that went between New Roads and uh, St. Francisville. And I wanted to build a shrine that it comes in five parts. Everything has to be odd numbers, all the plant material planted, odd numbers. And then I took this rope and, it, uh, and on the end corner is a cross uh, my wife and I were married in a, a Christian church, and we wanted this rope uh, to bind these two, our marriage together, and it's very nice. And a lot of folks that get married there have to have their picture taken. And this red Tory gate, uh, it came, I got this idea from the gardens in Hawaii, but if you go Japan, you see a lot of these Tory gates with this red, and but if you look at it close, it's red with blue paint. So we have to kind of uh, come up with our own color, but it's very nice. We were in Japan in 1977, my first trip with my parents, and we went to this. Uh, uh, Buddhist temple, because we were told there's a monument that was there uh, that was uh, uh, built by my great great grandfather who built it for his son. And his son, who passed away in 1980, 1884 uh, during the war with China, and 
the remains were sent back to, uh, to Hiroshima. So my great, great grandfather built this monument. It's, 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 a, not, it's a really, uh, we visited 1916, we found it and we may started making arrangements and we, we asked the priest, the Buddhist priest, if we could have it. And he said, yeah. And I think it was unusual because nobody wants a monument to be shipped back to, to Louisiana. Where, and, uh, and we got it there and it came out in good shape. Okay, and the next photo is all the parts coming in. And it's, it had to be cleaned, go through inspection by the Japanese government and the uh, American government. And you could see that uh, we were real proud of this. So this is, uh, puts it about 2019. And last year we erected, this is 2020. It, look how nice it is, all cleaned up. And we're really happy to have it here. And it's all written in, the kanji is from the dates it's over a century ago. So very hard to read. But I have a professor friend of mine who read this in the front, which uh, means uh, grave Imaharas, uh, the grave of every, everyone in the Imahara family, past and future. And, and the, on the side in the back is a story that's also been carved in. Okay, and this is the end of my uh, program. Yeah. Well, maybe you could tell just a little bit about how you contact, how you made the book come together. You're right, how you got the idea for collecting the stories, what you had to do to collect all the stories, and tell a little bit about that process. <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, I thought I, I like to get all my friends that were nearby. They were in camp. I said, can you write me a story? And I said, a short story. And so I got, I started writing and I saw finding people that were in camp during the period in Jerome and Roar, but most of them were gone, but some of them were in pretty good health. And, I, and all these stories started coming in. Then they told other people. Okay, And it really was amazing that they finally, uh, a Japanese person takes a lot of effort for them to talk about their past, but they it came it came out real well. Okay. The um, the the book, uh, in addition to um, writings by Walter and other his family members, as I said, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it's a something like forty or fifty different contributors. In some cases, they were the actual internees, the people like Walter who were in camp. Most, uh, they were all children uh, of different ages, those who are still around, who were in the camps. They're really recounting their experiences as young kids. Um, but in some cases, we have writings from the family members, uh, the sons and daughters of the internees. And they were able to talk a little bit about what happened uh, after the return and what the impact was on their families. So it's uh, quite an interesting collection of stories. And uh, I think at this point, we should probably just open it up for questions. Okay. Thank you both for being here again and for doing this. Um, we really appreciate it. We do have a question um, because I'm a historian and I like to go in chronological order. I've got questions about later stuff, but this is a question um, okay. from Roy Millard. And he says, you mentioned a loss of real and personal property. What happened to it? Your family farm, for example, was it confiscate, confiscated by the government and why was it never returned? My father told us that when he, at age, he was like, uh, uh, like age uh, in his twenties. He they purchased sixty acres, and that and uh, he, he was uh, born in America, so he was eligible to purchase property. So uh, it was a worst piece of land. This is outside of uh, Sacramento, because all the best land was 
used by the Caucasian farmers. So they got all the worst stuff. And and he bought it for ten thousand dollars, huh? Uh, Sixty acres and a two acre and a in a two story home. Okay. And the story is that when the war uh, started, uh, uh, he owed three thousand dollars. Okay, but his uh, mortgage was uh, uh, due. His bank account was closed. So the story is his property, like all the neighbors, knew about it. They, the Caucasian neighbors, they just came by. They went to the bank and picked up the note. And they just signed for it, and they got the land. And that was in. So we could never get it back, you know. Yeah, in my research, I think most of the people that we talked to were um, either they, you know, a, a kind neighbor took on the land and then, you know, never gave it back. Um, I think there was one instance where the, the Caucasian neighbor actually took care of the property and, you know, it was there when, when the Japanese American family came back. So um, we have another question from Sharon Cassidy. Um, she said, did many of the internees remain in or settle in Arkansas after the war? I would say no, because the war ended in August 1945. And by October, which is like two months later, you had to leave. But we found out that just a handful stayed in Arkansas. But uh, many of them had to leave. And that was the saddest part because a lot of the people didn't have a home to go to. And California didn't want the people back. See? Yeah. So it was really a, a dilemma. Well, and Sharon, um, actually Homer Adkins, who was our governor at the time, really made an effort to make people leave. He did not want Japanese Americans staying here. Um, a couple of families did come up to Little Rock, to the Scott area, and do some farming for the Alexander family. Um, and the one family that has stayed is the Yadas. Um, and I don't, I looked in the participants, I don't know that there are any Yadas on this um, program today, but they are the one family that stayed. Um, Richard's here in Little Rock. Robert is in Fort Smith. Um, and so the Yadas are around. Um, so there are, they, I love the Yadas. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, I get a little gushy about them. Um, so here's, an, um, here's another question. Let's see, how did you happen to go to school in Southwest Louisiana. So I was gonna ask the question, I was gonna tell us how you got to Louisiana. Uh, first, my uh, uh, parents, uh, they did not want to go back to California. They lost everything and California didn't want them back. So they thought that maybe they go South. So uh, they chose uh, Louisiana, New Orleans because they found out there's a lot of college and universities there. So they went there just for the children. Because my, when my father finally got there, uh, he was given, he couldn't get a good job. It's always a job that's kind of, it's uh, you, where people can't see you type of jobs. And he had to make a living just to put food on the table. Okay, but the, there's a good story here because uh, my, my parents had nine children, okay? And eight got college education, eight out of nine. And the ninth one went to, uh, 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 business school. So it was very good. Okay, and those nine, nine children, the four boys, we joined the military. It's, it's a success story. <laughs> yeah. Um, David Prince would like to know, can you describe in more detail about the conditions on the train coming from California? Okay, as a, a five years old, it was uh, it was rough. The trains were all in bad shape in the first place, and then they darkened the windows so you can't see out or people can't see in. Okay, and of course the seats are all wooden, and uh, and it's all uh, and the bathroom was in bad shape. Okay, because they were all dilapidated uh, cars for moving people in those days. <laughs> yeah, somehow we made it. Yeah, food was bad, but anyway, we got to we got to Arkansas. Yeah. Well, maybe you could talk a little bit. I mean, it's not something that people like to talk about, but the bathroom conditions, both at the Fresno Assembly Center 
and in the camps and talk a little bit about uh, that experience and how it affected uh, you and your sisters. Uh, the, uh, the, the bathrooms at the, at the Fresno is, uh, is it's like a trough with all these holes in a row in a trough and the water would gush through there every now and then to move the waste. Of course, if you're in the wrong end, you're gonna get splashed, but there's no petition, huh? So uh, even when we got to uh, uh, the camps in Jerome and Roar, uh, they had, by then they had toilets, but the toilets all next to each other. And for females, that was really terrible. And then they took a shower. And the shower is just open shower, like in uh, the, so a lot of the women got up early in the morning, go take a shower, but then everybody kind of did the same thing, so it didn't matter too much. Anyway, they never had no curtains or in between petition. It was bad on the uh, women folks, yeah. Yeah, that was one thing, you know, the lack of privacy, um, the, the fact that the barracks were small spaces with a whole family in them and sometimes, in a, you know, a larger extended family, um, the lack of, you know, we heard a lot from, from folks who were teenagers at the time, um, you know, that they could just go eat in the mess halls with whoever they wanted to. And so there was kind of a breakdown of the family dynamic in a way. Um, what did your parents do at camp? Did they have jobs? Uh, no, because my mother uh, had so many children, she didn't have to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, but my father was uh, like a, a manager for that block. And he got the top pay at nineteen dollars, uh, nineteen dollars a month. Okay, this is the same as a, a physician or a, a, the top educated people. Okay, but the uh, one of the things my father really worked on was to uh, improve the food. Okay, and it wasn't long before uh, the uh, the uh, farmers they, they used their land. In all 10 camps, I understand, they had enough farmers that they made production, whether it was uh, in the sand or in the wetlands. So the food did grow, yeah. Well, could you expand on that business about the eating in the mess hall instead of the family didn't eat together and that was a big change and, uh, and uh, the parents particularly were uh, very disturbed by that. And you, you have your own family that went through that experience. Uh, we had so many children in our family that it's hard to eat together, okay? And, and his children, of course, we don't know any difference. We just eat with other children. The adults eat with ad other adults. So the, the family unity broke down. And I remember the first thing that uh, my father got to uh, New Orleans, he went out and got a round table. And pretty soon everybody else got a round table and you all ate together and you all had to sit in a certain spot. <laughs> okay. And so the unity did come back. It took a while. Yeah. And I mean, your, your parents, you know, they opened a very successful nurse, nursery and horticulture business after the war. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, you know, their parents just never seemed the same after camp. What's your experience with that? I would say it, it took over uh, 10 years, uh, which, which puts it about 1955 plus, okay? Uh, with, my father started getting in business and uh, when he was a gardener, well, who's gonna hire a gardener in those days, okay? And everything in uh, Louisiana was overgrown. So he said, he gonna do some pruning because he knew about uh, the proper pruning for fruit trees and et cetera. So he started working on topiers and things like that. But there's a good story about there's one race of people that really helped as he struggled. It was the Jewish people, okay? They knew about the background of the Amber Harris. They knew back, background about the Japanese American. And they came up and most of them were professionals, had good jobs. So they hired my father, okay? And my, Cause now he's doing pruning, uh, planting shrubs and things. Then the word got around. So we always be grateful for the Jewish people. Good story. <laughs> what? 
We've got a question from Sharon again. Um, was it difficult for you and your brothers to serve in the U.S. military, given how you and your family and other Japanese Americans were treated? I was the first one in the uh, military. And when I, uh, 1960, so that puts about 15 years after the war. So some of the uh, military uh, uh, officials uh, were kind of, they, they, they kind of knew about the, our background being a American. So they, but there was still a little bit of resentment there. It was a little bit difficult. We got the, uh, they always put us at different tasks. So we had to become creative on how to become, uh, and going through officer candidate school, well, I had a hard time. They were trying to run me out because everybody six foot Caucasian. And here I come along, but they didn't know about my background in, uh, in weightlifting. So I started breaking all the OCS record. So pretty soon I uh, kind of become an asset. <laughs> and so uh, they left me alone and I graduated. And uh, in 19, uh, about 62, I graduated from there. And, this, and uh, that was when the uh, Berlin Wall was now being constructed. So we all were sent to Germany. Yeah. Well, something else that uh, is not much fun to talk about, but uh, you might talk, um, you talked that, you said that your parents uh, didn't want to go back to California because they knew there was so much resentment against the Japanese in California. So they stayed, started to go to Louisiana, hoping that things would be different, but and talk a little bit about what you did experience, what you and your family experienced when you uh, moved to Louisiana. The experience for uh, the children was not that good because uh, we were in grade school, you know, uh, we third, fourth grade, and every one of us were in uh, school. And uh, we're the only Japanese there. And of course, the children were kind of mean because they got that from the parents, huh? So, uh, we kind of understood that. So it took a while uh, and we always seemed to be picked on. Uh, we never get, get called on by the teachers. When, uh, maybe the grades were not, uh, we felt like one grade lower, but we kind of endured, yeah. But there's a point there when I was about uh, fourth grade, I was picked on all the time, beaten up and always beaten up by two or three at a time. But on this one occasion, I was on a swing and uh, and this white kid came up to me and I knew he wanted me to get off the swing. Okay, and I said, well, I'm gonna try something different. And I gave him the swing, I, he, he got on the swing and I had this one shot. I hit him with all I got. I mean, I hit him in the face, he went down and I, he was on the ground and I could see from the fear in his face that maybe uh, he is gonna defend it himself. Word got around that you you can you can call him you can tease him and all that, but one day he is going to strike back, and it kind of took from there. Grammar school, high school it worked pretty good. <laughs> Talk about also the experiences of some of your sisters in trying to get jobs and some of the issues, the problems they ran into because of their background. Uh, my sister May was the oldest. And she went to business school and uh, sometimes she makes what, uh, $9 a, a week in those days, she give half to my parents, okay? But she had a hard time getting a job because every time you fill it out, you got to put nationality down, okay? And she always put a Japanese American. And one time, and they were rejected because they would tell her they don't hire Japanese. One time she said, wait now, there's something wrong. In the South, it's either black or white. She put white, that was it. Never went out without a job after that. It's a good story. And your parents, so your parents are both Nisei. So they were born here, your Sansei. Um, and I always think that's important to point out to people that, you know, that they were born here, they were American citizens, um, that, so talk a little bit about them, about your parents and their early experiences here. Yeah, after the war, it was a, it really didn't matter if you're an American citizen or not. They, used, they look at, looked at my parents as Japanese and they would explain to them they're American citizen. 
But in old days, you know, it's, it's like, uh, who really cares? So they had a hard time. And we as children had to explain all the time to children. And we were hoping the teachers would pick it up that we're American citizens. And if the, uh, we have rights and all that, even though all rights as a citizen are taken away. But most of us, once we went through life, knowing this, we don't have any ill feeling. We understand that, huh? Yeah, so uh, we'll, uh, we're grateful to be here, naturally. And we're very good Americans. And, and uh, we, uh, we're told to take, uh, uh, we're very, uh, take our shots. We take a shot. We've got to join the Army, we join the Army, you know. A very good citizen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could also mention about the success of the Japanese immigrants in the farming communities in California before the war. And uh, it was kind of remarkable. It was, they were extremely successful farmers and they had a lot of innovative ideas. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's like my father, when he purchased a land, it was so bad. It's like a hayfield and rocks, sand. And this is uh, right outside Sacramento. So all the good land was already taken by the Caucasian farmers. So all the bad lands were uh, had to be purchased by the Japanese American, but they became good farmers. They took the rocks out and they, they knew about irrigation. They knew about pruning. Uh, they knew about fertilizing. So the technique of raising a crop was good and they, it showed up in the finished product when they took the vegetables uh, to the market. Sometimes uh, if you stood behind your vegetables and you were Japanese, some people would not buy it. But if they put the product side by side, it's outstanding. Okay, and then pretty soon, uh, like uh, my father was uh, taking care of the grapes, for instance, and, uh, and strawberry, they formed a co-op. By co-op, at a given time, they would fill boxcars full of uh, uh, strawberry or grapes and they send it to the Northern Market. So that's where the money was, okay. And so turn, that part turned out good. And last part is just before war started, my father had a, a barn on 60 acres and, it's, uh, and he wanted to grow, have to, uh, uh, sell chickens uh, and eggs. So he didn't know how to do it, but he did research. Okay, and he found that if you could put the chicken on wire inside of a building and give them the right feed and within uh, uh, several weeks, I mean, the chicken is ready for market, it's clean. Of course, you get the eggs, okay? So uh, he would uh, uh, get his truck and put in all the chickens in a crate and go down the highway and you got feathers all over. And when he got to the marketplace in Sacramento, by that time, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the buyers were women, okay? All the Caucasian women, because everybody ate egg, uh, it uh, ate chicken on Sunday. So on Saturday, big day, all oh, he would bring all these chickens and they would all be sold and sold their eggs because he knew Americans eat eggs every day. And that's what he called Caucasian, called Americans. Americans eat chicken every Sunday, eat eggs every day. And he said that was a near future, okay? And when he left the marketplace, my sister collected money, uh, 200, 250 in cash in those days. he bring it home and he said, he's gonna, this is done in a barn. Okay, so he's gonna really get creative. And he always told us the children that maybe uh, he gonna uh, uh, expand the chicken business. And maybe if he can get a processing uh, machine to process the chicken and put on ice, Caucasian will eat chicken more. War came along, his uh, dream passed away. He lost everything. Yeah, but he had a dream. One of the, uh, apparently one of the reasons for the resentment and the uh, antagonism against the Japanese in California was because they were so successful. There were many of them. They were extremely successful farmers and, and because they had novel and innovative farming methods, in some many cases, they were more successful than the, uh, than uh, the uh, other Americans there. And, and that helped, and, and that ironically helped build up some of that racial resentment. Um, I see one of the comments mm -hmm. mentions, 
One of the comments mentions, uh, uh, um, Bruce says that his folks ended up at Seabrook. So Walt, maybe you could talk about the Seabrook Farms experience and uh, what, uh, what role Seabrook Farms played during the war. Uh, when we were children, uh, you, and uh, certain people were being released. You gotta remember, once we got the roar, uh, pretty soon the guard towers were, were uh, vacated. The fence came down, nobody escaped. There's no place to go. There were talk around that a lot of people leaving for Seabrook Farms. And Mr. Seabrook is in uh, New Jersey. And if you look at the map, all the centuries ago, all the good earth ended up in New Jersey and farmland. And Mr. Seabrook was uh, uh, raising vegetables for quick freeze. So he needed workers, okay? So he got them out of camp and he give them housing. And, uh, and we, I went there many years ago just to see what it was. And there, there was no fence and the housing was really nice. And the, uh, the workers are really productive, huh? They're good on their hands because everything had to be done quickly because he had to uh, freeze, quick freeze. Okay, and there's, there was a, a story there that uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, workers uh, uh, were, they were all paid in, uh, in uh, paid cash, okay? And the townspeople, they resented that. They said, you know, this, all the, you have all these Japanese families there, they caused no trouble, but they don't give us any business. Mr. Seabrook, paid in dollar bill, in a dollar, uh, silver dollar. No more questions after that. <laughs> they, they got the, yeah. And still today, uh, Seabrook Farm is still in production, yeah. The, um, one of the uh, ironies of the whole situation was that, as Walter just mentioned, after some time and not uh, after a year or so, it was the authorities, the military authorities recognized that there was no threat from the internees. They weren't going to try to escape. They weren't going to try to commit any sabotage. They were no threat whatsoever. And, and so they became, so several things happened. First of all, they didn't bother to man the, and some, they stopped manning the guard towers at one point. And many of the, uh, some of the internees, some number of them were allowed to leave to take jobs. Um, and so, so quite a few of the older ones, as, as an example, was Walter's father. Walter's own father was allowed to leave the camp to take a job in another city. But the families were still in the camps. The families were still incarcerated. And they were not allowed to leave um, uh, for the most part uh, until, until the end of the war. And even when they closed down the Jerome camp, the Jerome camp was turned into a prisoner of war camp, the overwhelming majority of the internees were just shipped off to another camp. So many of them to Rower in Arkansas, just as Walter's family was, was but they were shipped to other internment camps uh, all around the United States. Uh, Rower and Jerome were the ones that were furthest east. They were the furthest away from California, but there were other camps in Utah and Arizona and so on. And a lot of them were sent off there. Well, and a lot of the, you know, Jerome closed, we had always heard Jerome closed so early because so many of the Japanese Americans in Jerome answered no and no to question 28 and 29. Oh, I shouldn't mm. have said that and I'll get it wrong. <laughs> um, okay. to, to the questionnaire. And so they, many of them were also sent to Tule Lake, which was the segregation camp in Northern California. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's even, you know, we can talk about the racism in California and the racism that was here, but that questionnaire was just an abomination um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they were, for folks who don't know, they were asked whether they um, would disavow allegiance to the Empire of Japan and pledge allegiance to the United States and if they'd serve in the military. And for a lot of people, it was a, it was a difficult decision because um, if their parents were not allowed to be citizens and um, had not been born here, um, they, they couldn't disavow their allegiance to the Empire of Japan um, and they couldn't pledge their allegiance to the United States. So it, it tore some families apart. And so it was really a difficult 
um, a difficult period within a more difficult period. Um, right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. As you point that out, the ones who uh, yeah. the no no, the so called no no boys, they were the many of them, most of them were sent off to Tule Lake in a special segregation facility. And they were considered especially threatening, and even though they were not, but yeah. And Kamiko Mar, hi Kamiko. Um, she just put a link to the loyalty questionnaire um, on a website. So thank you. Yes, that's a very important part. And Aaron, I'm also going to say hi to Aaron. Aaron, um, <laughs> the joke around here is I know everybody. <laughs> um, so Aaron, um, she would like to know what do you want people to take away from your story, from the stories that you've collected from the book. I think that uh, when uh, David and I are working on this, he don't say all the stories coming in were about uh, their feelings in camp. Of, uh, there were, uh, a lot of them had bad feeling that uh, because they were put in there because of race, huh? mm -hmm. but they were American. So that was the biggest question. Okay. And as we were in there, uh, one of the, it came up many times that, uh, a lot of the younger men joined the military and some did not because, you know, my parents are in camp, you know, and you want me to go die for this country. But there's a lot of good stories. You're going to hear about the, the 442nd unit like that. Okay. Most of them from Hawaii and, uh, and, but most of them, some of them came from, uh, of, uh, from the camps. Okay. And they, of course they did, have, they had got a, very good uh, record, you know, war record, yeah. One of, the, one of the things that struck me in reading the stories was despite all the horrendous things that were done to these families, uh, most of them felt themselves as very loyal Americans. They felt proud to be American citizens. Um, many of them were happy, uh, were actually proud, willing and proud to join the military. Some of Walter's closest friends actually uh, fought in the war with the u.s military who were in internees in the camps and then but would be they were older of course older than walter and but they were proud to serve and uh in a way that you might find surprising that, that even after all these things were done to them even when they were in the camps many of them still felt uh, very proud to be americans walt i see another question here from Aaron about uh it's an interesting one did your family talk about camp uh, after they left the camp? Was there much talk about it was, as you were growing up or did it take some time for you? When did you start sharing the stories about the camps? It took some time. Okay, but finally, uh, when they finally got on their uh, feet that most of the children now went to college and now getting on their, getting on their feet. Uh, my parents pushed three things up. Huh? Number one, you have to have an education. Number two, get a good job, huh? Because that would, uh, and uh, then, uh, then number three, which we all were told, we live by the rules, huh? Boy, you know, if America could do those three things right now, it'd be a nice place to live, <laughs> okay? But uh, doing, we knew all that. So my parents uh, uh, always told us to be good citizen, good, uh, do the best you can in grades and, when we get on jobs, we did give extra effort. So name got good in, our name got very well in the business, in the garden center and landscaping business. Okay, so uh, it came, we came a long ways and uh, most American, Japanese American who went to camp are still, uh, uh, we knew what happened, see? So we don't care with us. Uh, I think more and more uh, the people are now talking about it well, I mean, close to 80, 80 years huh, since Pearl Harbor. So uh, that's why I want to do a next book where I ask everybody in the whole 10 camps to send me a story. I found that in some cases I was trying to get some additional information from some of the former internees and some of them really didn't want to, you know, it was in the past for them. And in some cases, so some of them really, for the most part, I think most of the reports we got was that after the war, most of them just didn't talk about it very much. And uh, they were not that 
is not something that uh, later on, after many years, that was different. But for quite a while, as Walter said, it did take some time. Yeah. But for, for most of that first time, that was not a big topic of discussion. And Walt, I see there's another question here. Was life at the Jerome and Rower camps much like the camps in other states, or were they distinct in some way? What would how would you answer that? I think it's about the same. The, the camps were all built the same way. Same uh, uh, room was twenty by twenty. You get one light bulb and you get one uh, stove. And that was that was it. But as children, I think uh, uh, we didn't have any uh, dislikes or fear. Because you know we're there with the parents, and uh, you're under their care, and you got food. So as children, we just had a good time. We played a lot, but we didn't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> one one of the uh, the structure of the camps was very similar. I think they probably followed the same model in building the barracks. Oh, yes. But but one big difference was the weather. The weather was different at the different camps. Um, Arkansas in Arkansas it was swampy. It was we had swamps. And it was really hot and humid, and it was very rough. Uh, that was and, one of the and, the and in the winters, those winters were some of the coldest and snowiest that Arkansas had ever seen. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was like you get the you get here we say the weather changes every three days, but I mean, really, you got a very different um, climate for sure. Well, right, Heather, so, if you if you take all ten caps, the weather in all ten caps. They're in the worst place you can find. Yeah. So let's not yeah. talk about the dust quick, storms. The it was the dust storms and topaz oh, and, um, you know, Heart Mountain under that. And then in Arizona, the deserts on a, yeah, right. is it on a Navajo reservation or near it? Maybe Gila? Mm -hmm. Is Gila in? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, and but, I, we yeah. got people, I know we got people in the audience that are screaming at the screen going, no, it was this. Oh, Kimi Kimiko says that both Thank Arizona you. camps are in Indian land. Yes. Yeah. So you had uh, desert conditions in some places and very, very frigid. I, I guess at Utah, you had a very bitter winter winters in Topaz. So that, that was probably the biggest distinction from one camp to the other was the local climate. Uh, that was the one uh, thing that was that was clearly different from one camp. I would say all ten camps were in an isolated area. Yeah, right, right. But but you know you gotta remember, no one tried to escape anyway. <laughs> you know where are you gonna go with the Japanese face, and you're in a bad area. Where plus who's gonna help you? See, so it, the, no no worry about uh, escaping. Plus uh, you can stay in camp. You got uh, uh, housing and food. Right. Well, thank you both for doing this again. I think I've thanked you four or five times by now, but I have just, I've enjoyed this. Um, I've enjoyed this chat. Um, and if you want to watch it again or rewatch it, um, it'll be available on our YouTube page. You will get an email later today, maybe tomorrow with the link directly, um, but it'll be available okay. um, immediately. And next month on January 5th at noon, that's 2022, you, the Legacies and Lunch will be Sabine Schmidt and Don House talking about remote access, small public libraries in Arkansas. They have a new book out as well. So thank you again, David and Walter. I really appreciate it. Um, thank, thank you for inviting us. It was a yeah, pleasure to be that. here. And we, we appreciate the people tuning in and listening to the stories. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, everybody buy a copy of the book. I've seen a preview. It's awesome. So thanks, everybody. Bye.